I'm here with Dr. Romano to talk about ionization energy. Hi, I want to go over a topic that a lot of students have questions on. I get a lot of emails on this idea of ionization energy. So come around and let's look at what I prepared for you. Ionization energy is the minimum energy needed to remove an electron from a gaseous atom in the ground state. If X is the atom and you add energy to this atom in the gas phase, and notice I use the gas phase because in the gas phase, there's no other attractions. So we want to make sure we're isolated and it's got to be in the gas phase. When we add energy, we remove the electron and therefore X becomes an ion. Now the two trends that we need for the DAT exam is to understand as you go across the table from left to right, ionization energy is increasing. As you go from left to right, if you look at a periodic table, the atomic number is increasing. If the atomic number is increasing, that means that those valence electrons feel a greater nuclear attraction. If there's greater nuclear attraction and they're attracted to the nucleus, more energy is going to be needed to remove them. So going across the table, our argument has to do with the attraction that those electrons have for the increasing nuclear charge. As you're going down a group, the atom gets larger, and therefore it's easier to remove the valence electron. Now, so that sounds nice. Across the table, things are ionization energy is going up, ionization goes down as we are moving down a group. Now, there are two main exceptions that I want you to be careful of for the debt. I don't even think you'll see it, but just as a safety precaution. Remember the word no PS, N-O-P-S, that N is greater than O and P is greater than S. And now, if you have a periodic table in front of you, you would have thought the opposite. Since the O is further to the right, you would think O would be greater and sulfur would be greater than the P, but it's the opposite. I'll do one example, and the other example is the exact same argument. Let's look at phosphorus first and sulfur. I'm going to shoot for 15 electrons. So it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, and 3p3. All these are all filled up, but the 3p is not. We all know that in the 3p sublevel are 3p orbitals. So I'm going to draw three boxes. I'll call the first orbital 3px, 3py, 3pz. Those three orbitals all have equal energy, just different orientations. And I simply put an electron in, following Hunt's rule, into each orbital. Anytime you see orbitals that are filled or half-filled, it's stable, or relatively stable in the case of half-filled. Not as stable as if they were all filled, but this is reasonably stable when you see half-filled. When we do the same thing to sulfur, and we wrote out the configuration of 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4, you draw your three boxes again for the three p orbitals, one in each, and then you go back by Hun's rule, and I'm hoping you can see that if you remove one electron, say we remove this electron from here, you would still get half-filled sublevels. So it's not decreasing the stability as much as if you would remove from here. So this one would be a little bit easier to remove. So phosphorus, if you removed an electron, you're removing it from a more stable configuration. So that would mean that phosphorus would have a greater ionization energy. All right, I hope that gives you some good ideas on that. One last thing, the way I teach my students. Say we look at sodium. Sodium is in group one. Think of ionization energy as the energy required to, not to remove an electron from a gaseous atom, but if you think about it, the way I teach my kids is the energy required to remove a tooth. If you're in group one, that means you have one loose tooth. If you're in group two, you have two loose teeth. If you're in group 13, which is the old group three, think of that as three loose teeth. And then group 14, you got four loose teeth. So going back to number one, if you have one loose tooth, 
that means the second one would be very, very cemented and strong. So if you went to the ionization energies, and I showed you in kilojoules per mole, 496 was required to remove one electron or one tooth. But the second tooth, look at this. Look how much higher, look at the jump between ionization one and two. Let's try another one. Magnesium is in group two. So I'm gonna think of that as two loose teeth meaning that those first two would be easy or relatively easy to remove, but that third one would be very difficult. And once again, this is going to be reflected in the ionization values. 740 kilojoules per mole, then 1450, and then the third, loose, the third tooth would be the tooth that's not loose. Look at that big jump. So the biggest jump would be seen between I2 and I3, the second and the third ionization values. How about silicon? What do you think? Silicon is in group 14. You can think of silicon as four loose teeth. So that means that the biggest jump would be between what? I4 and I5. The first four would be easy. That fifth one would be very, very high. So the biggest jump would be between I4 and I5, where the I5 being significantly greater than those first four. I hope this gives you an idea on ionization energy. Um, we've got some really good questions in the new issue of the Death Destroyer that I want you to check out. All right, that wraps up this video on ionization energy. See you in study group.